Um, and so if you don't know me, my name is Rachel and I'm the Associate Pastor here at Campbelltown Church of Christ. And um, I want to bring the message to you this morning. So for those of you who um, know me, probably know that I like to run. So running um, is a pretty big part of my life. I would have to say that it is a habit that I have developed in my life. And I haven't always ran and I'm not fast. It's not that I'm a good runner. Um, I would, you know, always generally come last at school. But when I became a mum, I was only 21. And so because I was a young mum, I think I had this feeling of going, oh, I didn't want to lose myself. I didn't want to lose my health and my fitness. And so I decided uh, to start running. And um, I guess I started to like it. I enjoyed the um, peace and quiet and I liked the way the feeling of my feet hitting the ground and the stillness of my mind and so I continued to run and so I signed up um, for the city to surf and I've done a few of those races and I've done a half marathon and a full marathon as well and you know running long distances isn't easy Um, it's hard it's hard physically but I think the biggest challenge is actually mentally you see, um, while I'm running, especially at the beginning, there's like this, these words that are going on in my mind, you know, like, you know, you can't do it, you can't finish it, you're too tired, slow down, oh, this hill's so big. Um, and I find the beginning really, really difficult. But as I've um, been running now for Kaylin's, you know, almost 13 years, so as I've been running for 13 years, what I've realised within myself is that when I get to the halfway point, there's like this mental shift. Right? There's this mental shift when I go from being like, oh, I don't think I can do this to I can do this. And um, as I've reflected back on this, because it happens time and time again, as I've reflected back on this, I think what's happening for me is that I look at what's gone before. Right? I've gone, you know what, I've ran 10Ks. I've already ran 10Ks, so I know that I can keep running another 10Ks. It's like the past, even though it's, you know, only a second ago, but it's the past that has been that actually gives me the strength to know that I can keep on moving forward. And as I reflect on this shift that happens for me mentally while I run, it reminds me of um, the yet moments that we've been highlighting in the Lament series. I'm not sure if you guys have noticed that, but in our Lament series, um, time and time again in the Psalms, it was like this time where the Psalmist was complaining and asking, but then there was this yet moment, this yet moment where it was yet no matter what my circumstances, no matter my difficulty, no matter my challenge, no matter if I'm running up a hill, I'm going to choose to trust in God. And it's this shift that I have in running that I think it actually seems really similar to these yet moments that we see in the Psalms. And what we see in the Psalmist is they move from a place of faith, sorry, they move from a place of doubt into a place of faith. In these yet moments, they move from a place of weakness into a place of strength. In these yet moments, they move from a place of worry into a place of worship. Like I said earlier, this week we're beginning our series called Spiritual Habits That Lead to Life. And we're going to talk about habits that actually draw us closer to God. Habits that actually help us shift our attention from our circumstances to our God. Habits that can help us have our own yet moments. Habits that can help us have our own moments where we shift from doubt to faith where we shift from weakness to strength, where we shift from worry into worship. And so the spiritual habit today that we are going to look at is the spiritual habit of remembering. Can everyone say remembering? Awesome. Don't forget that word. All right. So in my message um, during our lament series, I don't know, did anyone hear that message, the last message of lament series? We looked at um, Psalm 77. All right. So in that series, um, we did the first part of the psalm. And I, I don't know if you guys know this about me, but I'm an optimist, right? You can probably tell by like my enthusiasm, but I always like to look on the bright side. But last time I preached, I began our lament series. And lament series wasn't quite the optimistic series, was it? <laughs> It was a little bit sad. And so when I prepared that message, I found a real tension in actually staying in the difficult part of Psalm 77. 
but I felt like I wouldn't be honoring the lament process if in the very first message I skipped (laughs) to the happy part of the psalm. And so in a way, the last time I preached, it was like Psalm 77 part one. But now I get this opportunity. I'm so glad that I get this opportunity to do Psalm 77 part two and put a little bit of a positive spin on it. And so that's what we're going to look do today. We're going to look again at the Psalm 77, but we're going to focus more so on um, the spiritual habit of remembering. We're not going to be looking necessarily at lamenting. We're going to be looking at how remembering served this psalmist. And so what I'm going to do, what we can do together is we're going to read Psalm 77. So if you have your Bible with you, you can pull that out. If you have your Bible app on your phone, you can open that up. Um, I'm actually going to read from the message paraphrase this morning. Sometimes I just really love the language in the message. And so let's read this psalm together. This is what it says. I yell out to my God. I yell with all my might. I yell at the top of my lungs. He listens. I found myself in trouble and went looking for my Lord. My life was an open wound that wouldn't heal. When friends friends said everything will turn out all right, I didn't believe a word they said. I remember God and shake my head. I bow my head then wring my hands. I'm awake all night, not a wink of sleep. I can't even say what's bothering me. I go over the days one by one. I ponder the years gone by. I strum my lute all through the night, wondering how to get my life together. Will the Lord walk off and leave us for good? Will he never smile again? Is his love worn threadbare? Has his salvation promised burnt out? Has God forgotten his manners? Has he angrily stalked off and left us? Just my luck, I said. The high God goes out of business just the moment I need him. Once again, I'll go over what God has done. Lay out on the table the ancient wonders. I'll ponder all the things you've accomplished and give a long, loving look at your acts. O God, your way is holy. No God is great like God. You're the God who makes things happen. You showed everyone what you can do. You pulled your people out of the worst kind of trouble, rescued the children of Jacob and Joseph. Ocean saw you in action, God, saw you and trembled with fear. Deep ocean was scared to death. Clouds belched buckets of rain. Sky exploded with thunder. Your arrows flashing this way and that. From whirlwind came your thundering voice. Lightning exposed the world. Earth reeled and rocked. You strode right through ocean. Walked straight through roaring ocean. But nobody saw you come or go. Hidden in the hands of Moses and Aaron, you led your people like a flock of sheep. Now, I'm wondering, as you were listening to that psalm, I'm wondering if you picked up on this theme of remembering. And I wonder if you heard that yet moment, that shift moment. And so what I want us to do is to look at how this psalm can be broken up. And so the first way the psalm can be broken up um, is in verses 1 and 2. And in verses 1 and 2, we see the psalmist, he, he begins by remembering that God is there. Right, He begins by remembering that God is there. He yells out to him, but he says, God listens. He knows that God is there. And then verses 2 to 6, we see the psalmist shift his attention from God to his circumstances. And he starts talking about what is going on in his world. He starts being consumed with the things that he can see and feel. And then it's interesting then because the next verse is verses 7 to 9. We see that he starts to question God. And if I could give you a visual, it's almost like he starts to spiral down. Right? His faith starts to become doubt. His weakness, sorry, his strength 
starts to become weakness and his worship starts to become worry. But then in verse 11, it's almost like there's this full stop. There's this full stop. And he didn't say yet in the message paraphrase, it said this, it says, once again, I will go over what God has done. I will go over what God has done. That's just another way of saying, I'm going to remember what you have done. And this is that yet moment. It's that full stop moment and the spiral doesn't keep going down, but it actually stops and he starts to spiral back up and his doubt starts to turn into faith and his weakness starts to turn into strength and his worry starts to become worship. And from verse 11, we see that the psalmist then can sit in a place where he praises God for the things that he has done in the past. You see, the psalmist here, when he remembers what has gone before, he finds the strength to move forward. He finds the strength through God because he knows God's reputation. He knows what God has done. He sees the way that he has worked and that gives him the strength to overcome what lays in front of him. And so as we think, well, what can we learn from this psalmist? How can we apply this message to our life today? How can we use the spiritual habit of remembering to draw us closer to God? Well, I want to suggest that there's two ways. There's two ways that we can remember. Two ways that we can create habits to remember that God is there and that we can draw close to him. And I think the very first example in this passage comes in verses 1 to 2. Right? In verses 1 to 2, the psalmist begins by remembering that God is there. Right? He begins by remembering God is there. And you, I don't know if you picked it up on it, but he's not in a good mood. Right? He's yelling. I yell out to God. I yell at the top of my lungs. All right, when I think of the times that I'm yelling at the top of my lungs, I'm generally not happy, right? I know sometimes we yell because we're excited if we're at a concert or if we're on a roller coaster, but I don't think this is the case for the psalmist. I don't think he's on a roller coaster going, woohoo! I think he's yelling out of pain and out of anguish. So he's in a difficult place. He's even, it sounds like he's in a torturous place, yet he begins by remembering that God is there. You see, it's almost like it's a reflex for him. It's an instinct for him that when he's going through pain, when he's going through difficulty, he can begin by remembering God is there. And if we think of our spiritual lives like a muscle, right, we can use spiritual habits to develop a reflex to remember God. I don't know if you've heard of the term muscle memory. Has anyone heard of the term muscle memory? Yeah, okay. So the definition of muscle memory is this. It says muscle memory is the act of committing a specific motor task into memory through repetition. Okay, so it's the act of committing a specific motor task into memory through repetition. Okay, so it's not like our muscles are remembering anything, right? Our muscles don't have a brain. But what's happening with our muscles is that when we repeat something over and over again, we're creating this pathway so that when we come into a similar circumstance or situation, our muscle remembers what to do. It's a little bit like drawing a line in the sand, right? You draw a line in the sand and then you do it again, the line gets deeper and clearer. You do it again, the line gets deeper and clearer. You do it again, the line gets deeper and clearer. And you know, one day I was at the beach with my kids and they were um, on the sand and they were making like tunnels in the sand and um, they would get a ball and they would let the ball go from the top and they'd try to get it all the way down to the bottom. But you see, what would happen sometimes is the ball would come up and out and it wouldn't get to the end. It wouldn't finish the task. But so what they did is they dug the tunnel deeper and clearer. So when they put the ball in the top, it actually went all the way to the end. And that's a little bit like our muscle memory. Every time we do that through repetition, we're making that tunnel deeper and clearer. So when we hit those times in our life, 
The ball knows to go to God. We know to turn to him to remember that he is there. I actually want to show you something. I saw this done in my pre, um, prenatal class, but it has an application for us. So um, I'm going to blow up this balloon for the first time. And I want you to count how many breaths it takes me to blow up the balloon. Can we do that? Yeah. Okay. Ready? Let's go. Um, hopefully I won't pass out. Ready? Let's go. <laughs> All right, so we're going to do it. Six. If there were kids in the room, they would have been laughing then. <laughs> All right, that noise. All right, now I'm going to do it again. Okay, let's count how many breaths it takes me to blow up again. All right, let's go. All right. Do you reckon that's about the same or one more? One more. Four. Right? Now, I'm getting a little bit lightheaded, so I'm not going to do it again. But if I did it again, I'm going to have to stop talking for a little bit. If I did it again, how many do you think it would take? Three. Less, right? You see, because the balloon had done it before, it knew how to do it again, right? And it was more efficient. And that's like our muscle memory. That's like when we remember God. If once we do it before, then we know how to do it again. And so what I'm wondering is how can we create this reflex, this instinct of remembering God, that God is there at the beginning? You see, for my family, what we do um, Monday to Friday is each morning um, we start by remembering that God is there. We have a cup of tea and we read the Bible. I usually write down on um, the Bible passages that we learn about at church. And so we'll read a few verses and then we ask like what the prayer points are for the day. And then we spend some time praying as a family. And we do this each morning. And the reason why we do this is because I want our family to have this muscle memory, to have this instinct, to have this reflex, to begin by remembering that God is there. You see, my prayer and hope is that as my children grow through life and when they hit those times of crisis, that they will begin by remembering that God is there, that He is present, that they can talk to Him about it that they can turn to his word and his word will provide solutions to their life and to their situation. You see, I think that as a family, if we only prayed and read our Bible every six months together, that it would be so unlikely for their response to be to turn to God. And I'm not just doing it for them. I also do it for me as well. It creates this habit. It creates this instinct. It creates this reflex. Do you know, if I don't go for a run for a week, my body starts to tell me, right? I'll start to go a bit crazy. I'll start probably yelling at the kids more and I'll start getting really frustrated. You see, when I don't do it for a while, my body reminds me, this is what you need to do. It's a habit in my life. And it's the same for us beginning our day, remembering God is there. If we don't do it for a few days, we notice it. It's a habit. It's something that we do each and every day. And when we create this muscle memory, when we create this reflex, when we create this instinct, it means that even in those times when we are yelling at the top of our lungs, it means that we still know that God is there, that we can remember that He is there. And the second example of remembering that we can learn from the psalmist it comes halfway through the psalm. It's at that yet moment, that shift moment. It's in verse 11 where the psalmist says, once again, not for the first time, once again, I'll go over what God has done. You see, if the first thing that we can learn is to have this reflex, this instinct to begin with remembering God is there, then I think the second thing that we can learn is that we can look at what God has done before to give us the strength to overcome what is ahead. You see, for the psalmist, what he was reflecting on was the crossing of the Red Sea. Did you guys pick up on that? Right, He was talking about when the Israelites crossed the Red Sea. 
You see, for the Israelites, this was such a defining moment in their life because up until then, they were in slavery with the Egyptians, right? But God gave them a way out and they thought, yes, we're free. But then all of a sudden, when they thought they were going to their freedom, they came to the Red Sea. They came to the Red Sea and they felt like there was no way forward. But God did something miraculous in that moment. Right, And he parted the Red Sea so the Israelites could be set free from slavery. You see, the psalmist went back and he remembered this moment because it was so critical to the story of the Israelites. It was a time when God took them from slavery into a place of freedom. And so I wonder for us, as we reflect on our life, what would be our Red Sea moment? What would be our Red Sea moment? When did God make a way for us when it felt like there was no way? See, I want to share one of my Red Sea moments with you guys today. Um, Last time when I spoke in the Lament series, um, I spoke about one of the most difficult times in my life. And just in case you weren't here and didn't hear about it, I'll give a little bit of a recap. But one day, my younger sister came to me and my older sister and told us that she was having memories of my grandfather coming into her bedroom and sexually assaulting her at night. And I remember this time in my life, um, I could empathize with the psalmist when he said, you know, I couldn't sleep. I was in agony thinking, how am I going to pull my life together? And I remember when I shared that with you last time, I ended the story there. Um, But today, I want to let you know that that, I didn't finish in that space. God didn't leave me in a space of emptiness, in a space of wondering, in a space where I felt like I couldn't trust him or that he wasn't good. You see, in this time um, when I was struggling and processing and going through that, um, there was one particular day where I was just spending time with God and God gave me this picture. And this picture was me... um, in a valley. And I was sort of like, there was these big cliffs beside me and I was sitting in the bottom of this valley and I was on my knees and my head was down and I was crying. And there was just these clouds above me and there was this rain just pouring on me. But I felt like I heard God whisper something into my ear and he whispered, what comes after the rain? What comes after the rain? And I said, life. And it was in that moment, I felt like that was a promise. It was a promise from God. And he was saying, I'm going to bring life out of this situation. And it didn't actually happen then. It happened 12 months later. 12 months later, I went to the Hillsong Colour Conference. And um, I was sitting in a stadium. And I was sitting in a stadium and the song, um, Good, Good Father, started to play. I don't know if you're familiar with that song. We sang it last week at church. But this song is all about how God is good. And not only is he good, but he is a good father. That he is a good father that takes care of us and loves us in the way that nobody in this world could ever love us. And as that song was playing, it's like I felt that picture of being in a valley. It was like the stadium were like was the sides of the cliff. And then all of a sudden, like this, and like I'm sure um, Hillsong planned this, <laughs> but all of a sudden, I wasn't aware of it, but this waterfall started falling from the roof and it reminded me of the rain. And then as the song kept on playing, all of a sudden, these flowers started springing up from the ground and these vines dropped from the roof. And it was in that moment that I felt like the life had come from that situation, that I'd gone from a place of not being able to trust God, of not even believing in God, in being angry and hateful towards God, into this space where I knew that he was my good, good father. You see, those 12 months of my life were so difficult, but it's actually a story that I come back to time and time again. When I feel like I can't trust God, I remember that story. I remember the way that he worked in my life. I remember all the little things that he pulled together to be able to put my heart back together. 
just like the psalmist remembered his Red Sea. I have times in my life, I have my Red Sea moments that I can go back and I can draw on to give me the strength to overcome what is ahead of me. And so out of this message today, I want to give you two questions to reflect on, one thing to remember and two ways to respond. So the questions to reflect on, the first question is, how can I create a spiritual muscle memory to begin by remembering God is there? I'm not sure you might already do this. So if you've already done this, you can go, oh, tick. I don't have to keep listening to Rachel for the next minute. <laughs> done. But if you don't, if you don't begin your day with remembering that God is there, I wonder if you could spend some time reflecting, how could I do that? How could I do that? Is it just as when my feet hit the floor, I'm just going to say, thank you that you're here with me today, God? Is it going to be that, you know, as I eat my breakfast, I'm going to pull out my Bible and I'm going to read some of God's word? Maybe you're not a morning person, so maybe you're just going to keep your eyes closed when your alarm goes off and you're going to spend the first five minutes with your eyes closed, laying in bed, slowly waking up, but inviting God to join you, join him in your day. I hope this week that you spend some time reflecting on how can I create that muscle memory, that instinct, that reflex, that habit, so that if I don't do it, I miss it. How can I do that? And the second question that I'd love for you to reflect on is what is my Red Sea moment? What is my Red Sea moment? Yes, we can remember what God did for the Israelites because that's an amazing story. But I think something what's more powerful is something that you've lived through, something that you've experienced. So I hope that this week that you can spend some time reflecting on what was my Red Sea moment and how can I commit that to memory? How can I commit that to memory so I can say, once again, I'll go over. Once again, I'll go over. That this story will just be sitting there in your mind, ready to remember when you need to find that strength. And if I can give you one thing to remember from today, one thing to remember, it's this. That what God has done, remember what God has done before, so that I have the strength to overcome what is ahead. That this can be a spiritual habit for us, that we can remember what God has done before so that we can have the strength to overcome what is ahead. And if I can give you two ways to respond, I'm going to do step one and step two. So if you, don't have, if you haven't done step one, I just want you to stay at step one. But if that's something that you've already explored and you think you've already got that, then you can move to step two. So step one is to choose one way you can start your day by remembering God is there. Right? So maybe the beginning of the week you can reflect, <laughs> how am I going to do this? But by the end of the week, maybe you could choose. Choose what is one thing, one small thing that I can do each day to start by remembering that God is there. And so if you don't do that, I hope that that's a way that you can respond to this message today. But if you do already do that, I've got a step, do, step two. And that is to write down your Red Sea moment. To write down your Red Sea moment. You see, I've spent some time doing formation. So I've had a chance to tell my story a few times. I've also um, had mentors and supervisors who've told me to write down my life story. And I've had post-it notes and timelines and all those sorts of things. But what that actually does is it helps you to recall those memories. It helps you to recall if we have something happen and then we don't think about it for 10 years, it's like it takes us so long to get that memory and we might even forget some of the best details about it. But if we take some time to write that down, to write that experience down, it means that when we're struggling, there's something actually that we can pick up. Something that we can go to, that we can read over, that once again, I'll go over what God has done in my life. Because I know for me, that has been a spiritual habit. That spiritual habit of remembering has helped me draw close to God at some of the most difficult times in my life. And the last thing that I want to say today 
is I'm curious if there's anyone sitting in the room thinking, well, I haven't had that Red Sea moment. I haven't had that moment where I, there's something in front of me and I don't see a way forward and that, that, that way comes. You see, the Red Sea moment, like I said, for the Israelites was when they crossed the Red Sea. For the Israelites, that was such an important time in their history. It represented when they went from slavery into freedom. But you see, for Christians, our Red Sea moment is Jesus and what he did on the cross. You know, just like Jesus, um, Jess said this morning in the communion message, that Jesus did the impossible. He made it possible for us to be close to God, to be in a relationship with God. And so if you haven't had your Red Sea moment yet, if you've never had a Red Sea moment, I want to let you know that Jesus has made a Red Sea moment available for you today. That he came down to this earth, that he died on this cross and he came back to life so that you can be close to your heavenly father. That you can have a good, good father who loves you and who will protect you and who will walk with you every step of the way. And so if as I'm speaking about that Red Sea moment, if there's something stirring inside of you this morning, I would love to talk to you more about that. And I know that once you have that first Red Sea moment with Jesus, that there will be more to come. There will be more to come because he doesn't just come and work once. He will work time and time again in your life. And so right now, I just want us to pray as we finish up. So let's pray together. Dear Jesus, I just thank you so much for the way that you work in our life. I thank you so much that you were there that you were there for the good days and that you were there for the bad days. And Lord, I pray as a church, Lord, that we will be developing a habit of remembering that you are there, that you are there for us. And Lord, I just pray and thank you so much for the way that you are working in our lives. I thank you that you work in the incredible, that you work in the miraculous, that you know how to make a way forward. And so, Lord, I'm praying that we will be a church that um, is full of people who have experienced Red Sea moments time and time again. And, Lord, give us the courage to remember these moments, to remember them so that we can share them with the people around us. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you made a way, that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross so that we can be close to you. And, Lord, as we go through our week, I just pray that we will remember, remember what you have done in our life. In Jesus' name, amen.